United States. Small talk while the pictures are being taken. Right. I uh, <clears throat> I thought seriously of bringing Pearl Bailey instead. <laughs> well, she was a hit. Uh, yes, she's, she's quite a girl. She is unbelievable. <laughs> she's getting more, she's got more energy than anybody in the room last night. I believe. And I understand she once had a heart attack. I didn't know. That's amazing. Some years ago. Do you, uh, do you have these four opportunities two or four times a day? I don't know. It's amazing. Depends on the schedule. You know? I mean, heads of state or anything, they all come into it. Yeah. He's been there. Yeah. 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 And they all bring their microphones <clears throat> also in case you say something. I it's hard to notice that. I always want to ask you a question when you're trying to get out of town for a little rest. <laughs> or when you get back in town for a little rest. On the border there with Montreal. And back to apparently Montreal loses. I believe I empathize very much with those 15 particularly because fresh in my mind are memories of my own first days as governor and inherited a rather horrendous situation. For whatever encouragement it'll be, I'll tell you that one morning on the way into the office, and it seemed as if every day a new problem was awaiting, I heard a disc jockey and I became an instant fan with what he said. I was listening to the radio in the car on the way in, and suddenly he said, every man should take unto himself a wife because sooner or later, something is bound to happen that you can't blame on the governor. <laughs> and seriously, I still feel that being governor was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. To those who are new, you will find yourself going home some nights feeling 10 feet tall. During the first two years that I've been here, the government has played a, or the governors have played a, a very key role in many of our in initiatives. And that prominence and effectiveness is continuing under the leadership of Scott Matheson. I understand the, your concern about the state of our economy and the effect of the recession has had on federal and state revenues. As I said last night, I believe, however, that there's real reason to be encouraged. Uh, the lowering of the inflation and interest rates provides a solid base from which economic recovery can take place. I can also understand your concern that uh, nothing be done to diminish the recovery, thus causing additional downward pressure on state revenues. If the economic recovery is stronger, as some economists predict, then some of the federal deficit problems will be eased. The deficit spending, of course, is of concern to all of us. Unless the sovereign states are economically strong, it'll be difficult for them to assume increased authority and responsibility that should be returned to all of you and to your states. Last Thursday, I sent to the Congress a proposal for four megablock grants, which would give you increased flexibility to meet the needs of your citizens in a variety of areas. Many of your suggestions uh, are included in the legislation that we've sent to the Hill. And I want to reiterate my support for significant adjustments to the state-federal relationship. The strides that have already been made are due to a closer working relationship that has existed heretofore between the states and the federal government. We've accomplished much in the areas of block grants and deregulation. Federalism legislation that is sent to Congress is another step, I think, in that right direction. I realize that there are areas of the fiscal year 84 budget in which we disagree. 
As you know, we looked at all alternatives, and I feel our budget is fair and thoughtful. And I think as you look at the tough decisions in a detailed budget, you may agree. However, I'll be glad to hear your comments and suggestions on that subject. But first, let me just make a few comments. I have serious problems with your call for excessive cuts in defense. Such a reduction in the growth of defense spending will weaken the nation severely. Remember that when John Kennedy was president, defense spending was around 45 percent of the federal budget. Even after the full defense buildup that I call for, defense spending will only be 26.7 percent of our federal budget. Also, a number of you have been quoted as saying that the revenue proposal you're considering would translate into a National Governors Association policy to cap the third year of the tax cut and elimination of tax indexing. I believe that Governors Blanchard and Dukakis have made such a statement, and I have to say these are both proposals that I oppose. Uh, I oppose them because built into our tax policies before we got here in legislation passed in 1977 were ongoing tax increases in a variety of ways plus bracket creep from indexing that our tax cuts have done little more than hold off a vast increase in the amount of money that we're taking from the citizens which certainly is not the way to aid a recovery or come out of a recession how would you raise your $70 billion figure? And finally, however, I'm encouraged by your proposed statement of support for $15 to $18 billion in cuts in non-means-tested entitlements. This is about the same figure as my budget proposals and my proposed reforms on Medicaid and Medicare. Now, I know that time is limited and we should be getting to the discussion and I do want to hear from you. I thank you for being here and look forward to your comments and hope now that in addition to your agenda, Scott, that we can hear from some of the new governors. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I believe this is the largest attendance of governors we've had in a national governors meeting in Washington for some years. I suspect that governors are here out of concern for the ability to uh, govern in their own states as much as the delight to be in Washington. But I sense that our purposes here are important on this occasion, and uh, I think the governors have made a pretty firm commitment to become involved in the dialogue of the budget in, at the federal level and are anxious to become a part of the national consensus to address it and to ultimately reduce those out-year deficits to the point where we uh, expunge, hopefully forever, uh, the structural portion of those deficits. Uh, I appreciate that you have mentioned the resolution uh, which we have uh, passed through the executive committee to be considered by the plenary session tomorrow. Uh, a major effort is underway on the part of governors who come into this meeting with 47 of the 50 states having suffered a shortfall of revenues much greater than their appropriations. Uh, California has a deficit of somewhere around 1.6 to 1.8 billion dollars, for example, and many of the smaller states, if you use comparative figures, are even worse. Uh, that forces uh, governors to look at the long-term impacts of interest rates and the out-year deficit and prompts for the first time, Mr. President, the governors examining the question of the overall federal budgeting process, uh, basically in a self-interest approach because of the national recovery, recovery does not uh, continue and grow, uh, then the problems of raising taxes and reducing expenditures at home continue. And so in the spirit of that uh, effort, we, we come to Washington to engage in an open dialogue on that process. And uh, our efforts in that regard are meant uh, to achieve ultimate solutions in a totally appropriate and professional way. I do believe that our efforts to achieve a 
deficit no greater. We, of course, we all are opposed to any deficits. I think if we uh, did a show of hands, we all want to get the budget balanced. But the reality is it will take time, years. And so we are prepared to examine that in a very practical, matter-of-fact sort of way and have suggested we ought to get down to no more than 2% of gross national product by 1988. That would leave a $90 billion deficit, which is not acceptable, but in our opinion is about as good as we can get to unless the economy upturns and hopefully it will. So we're here to address those questions uh, basically uh, from that perspective. Uh, there are some differences uh, in the uh, budget which you have sent to the, to the Hill. Uh, what we would like to do is have an open dialogue and discuss those issues. And if I may, I would like to call upon uh, Governor Jim Thompson to offer some comments on the resolution. And then if I may, next to Governor Richard Lamb for further comments. Mm. Mr. President, with, uh, with all deference to some of my Democratic brothers uh, you may have seen on television, the NGA speaks through its resolutions and through its resolutions only. It doesn't speak through Democrats, it doesn't speak through Republicans. It doesn't speak with one governor's voice. I agreed to co-sponsor the resolution before the National Governors Association because I was concerned both as a governor and as an American about the ability of our nation to sustained recovery. I have for the last two years consistently rejected the notion that was offered by opponents of mine during my last campaign that this recession is the product of any one administration or of any one party. Economic policy in this nation is made both by the President by the Congress, by the final action of Congress, since they had the last word. Congress is split between Republican and Democratic control. You yourself have said many times that you are concerned the nation has not come out of recession as quickly as you would have liked. We have all been waiting for recovery. And I guess what we fear most is that if we cannot offer the markets of this nation some assurance that the Congress as the will to grapple with the built-in structural deficits that you faced when you assumed your presidency, that we'll see that prime rate going right back up again, and we'll see inflation going right back up again, and we'll be right back on our backs in worse position than we were in this last recession from which we are now emerging. I think that's why you came to Washington, to reverse that growth. And you have had the courage, in my view, take on some of the sacred cows of the federal budget. And you've had the courage to say to the governors, you've been asking for more authority and more power and more control over your own lives. That comes at some fiscal cost. So in, in your first administration, in your first year, we supported you as an association and indeed provided some of the votes on the Hill to help pass the budget resolutions, tax cuts that you deemed essential to your economic program. And many of us still support what we did back then and have not retreated from what you've said. Many of us disagree with you respectfully, sir, about where and in what magnitude the budget might be cut. But so do others who are fervent political supporters of yours on the Hill and in your park. The bottom line is that we want to come out at the same place that you want to come out. We want to take down the size of the out-year deficits. We want, to, we want to reverse the structural deficits that are now built in. We want to reverse the notion that spending, even for such things as, as non-means-tested entitlement programs, motherhood issues, Medicare, uh, we go against that at great political risk. As, as governors, as you might suspect, we endorsed the uh, bipartisan Social Security recommendation by a vote of the executive committee at our last meeting, we're stepping out as far as, as governors have ever stepped out to get to the same bottom line as you, because we believe, like you, that the nation cannot sustain federal government spending beyond the revenues that we're willing to raise. And, and I think that uh, 
even though we may disagree, that, that disagreement is going to be ultimately resolved in the Congress, or it should be. The governors have little or no defense capacity, but the Congress certainly does, by virtue of the authority committed to it under the Constitution. You certainly do as the Commander-in-Chief, together with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We have made our suggestions. We want to be part of the debate. And we think that, that your administration should welcome our entry into the debate, even if we come in initially on terms that you may oppose. So I view the resolution as a resolution of support for your fundamental goals, and I'm supporting it on that basis. May we go to Governor Lamb? Mr. President, in the history of this nation, of course, uh, in moments of danger, there's always somehow come together a bipartisan coalition that says there is not a Republican solution or a Democratic solution, but a, an American solution that <coughs> somehow can, can make sense. We are not trying to criticize. We are really trying to be constructive. Uh, I think all of us as chief executives recognize that we are going into a, an era of hard choices, that there is going to be no choices that are going to be easily made. And, in all of the uh, distribution of, uh, of the sacrifice that we're trying to, to make some sense out of this. Now, I was asked to uh, give you a very brief report of sort of the state of human resources. Uh, and I do it in that recognition that there are, in fact, uh, to govern and is to make a series of hard choices. And uh, there's going to be somebody that's going to, as you know, criticize you whatever choices that, uh, that you make. But, in the human resources area, for instance, 100% of the states have reduced um, their health services to, to mothers and, and, and children. 47 states, or 94% of them, have cut back on the, the child health block care grants. 27 states have reduced the, the funds to, to crippled children. And on and on and on it goes. And I think that we're not recognizing that's not, there are some hard choices that are, that are going to have to be made. And I think when we look at those programs that we see the direct responsibility of, that we do recognize that um, there is some, in this weighing process, there, is, uh, there, there, are, there has to be a bipartisan coalition. The, the MX uh, missile is made in my state, needs lots, lots of jobs, but instead of 240 MX missiles, uh, if 239 were built, we could completely fund all of those programs that I, I just alluded to. The bottom line is not to criticize, but is to say that uh, the intention of this is to, is to try to put forth a balanced program on a bipartisan basis, which really says that it isn't uh, any one party's fault, but that all parties can add to a solution to the problem. Would you be uh, willing to take some questions from the governor? Yes, yes, I would. The president, uh, the, the budget resolution is on the table. Uh, I think it's time for any Governor, to make presentation, ask any question uh, he feels that he would like to present at this time. We'll go first to Governor Bond, if we may. Mr. President, uh, I believe the governors feel very strongly in supporting this deficit resolution that we hope no further financial burdens will be uh, transferred to the states because we simply cannot afford it. And Governor Lamb, I believe, uh, referring to the potential shifting of any burdens in health and human services cost to the state, I'd like to, to urge and to ask uh, the administration's position on maintaining tax-exempt financing for state and local bonds, because this is always one area that seems to be targeted when people talk about raising taxes. The simple point is that the Treasury does not lose money. Well, I'm not aware of anything. Don, am I <laughs> missing something? I'm not aware that we've ever wanted to take away the tax uh, 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 or the tax situation that uh, we would not impose a tax on uh, what have always been tax-free securities at the local and state level. Uh, no, Mr. President, not in general. The question is, is how far do the individual states intend to carry this? Uh, many of the states are now taking advantage of their tax-exempt status to get into other areas to loan money that have normally been the function of commercial banks. Uh, the, in the housing market, for example, uh, and in industrial revenue bonds, the states have really pushed this to its ultimate. 
Uh, and while the governor may say there's no loss of revenue, I'd like to debate that privately with him at some time, show him two of the facts of what we've developed in the Treasury as far as uh, the cost to us uh, in revenue. Uh, and as to why uh, the states think that they have to subsidize private industry, a profit-making industry such as housing, uh, except where needed for uh, low-cost housing, uh, is beyond me. The housing industry has and is making quite a recovery. Uh, starts now are, are at a rate of about a million and a half. The real estate market uh, in turnovers of secondary homes has really been booming in January. Uh, the thing is, is now getting underway. As interest rates come down, I think the governors have to think through uh, whether or not they wish to continue subsidizing uh, housing uh, in order to uh, make higher profits for the housing industry and whether or not that is a proper role for a state government. <coughs> Mr. President, very respectfully, the only way we're providing any low and moderate income housing, single family housing for, for the poor or the less fortunate in our states is through the tax exempt mortgage revenue bonds. And we'll uh, accept uh, Secretary Regan's offer. We'll be happy to discuss that with him further. May I, before another question, may I just respond to something that has been said already uh, here before we started the questioning? With regard to that part of the budget of defense, and yesterday, yes, I was watching television and I heard some criticisms that we're unfair and that we're, uh, we have benefited the rich at the expense of those who aren't rich. I don't know of anyone that can point to any single thing that can prove that. Uh, our tax program was across the board. Obviously, the fellow paying a small tax and getting a 25% savings as of July when that goes into effect is going to be paying a smaller, 25% less than he was paying. But the same is also true when you get up to the fellow at the top of the earnings scale. He's paying a very large tax and he's going to pay 25% less. The only suggestion that there's some unfairness in this could be from those people who would like to increase the progressivity of the tax. Now, the Congress has passed one that goes to a top ta tax bracket of 50 percent. And I don't think that in the guise of giving a tax cut, that it was our place to quietly turn around and increase the progressivity of the tax in some way, particularly when lack of investment capital is one of the problems uh, in connection with this recession. The other point having to do with that we're canceling programs that hurt the poor and we're not doing anything that hurts the rich. Our budget for health and human services is the biggest it has ever been in history. It is a percentage of almost 37 percent of the budget. Defense spending, on the other hand, is only 26.7 percent of the budget. And we can prove in any number of ways uh, what we are, are doing to the people, for example, in food stamps. Yes, we've had some reforms. We saved about a billion dollars last year that we found was in fraud and waste and outright, uh, well, mainly fraud of people that were not supposed to be getting the food stamps. And we have made some reforms, or the bill would be much higher, but as of today, we are providing food stamps for three million more people than we were providing in 1980, and the cost is about four billion dollars bigger than it was in 1980. With regard to the defense spending, you would have to know what we found when we came here. Defense spending had decreased in real dollars 20 percent over the decade of the 70s. The increase in the social reforms, the transfer payments of people had gone up in that same period 122 percent. Now, we found a volunteer army that had most people thinking the only solution was to go back to the draft. On any given day, 50 percent of our airplanes couldn't fly for lack of spare parts. Almost the same percentage of our ships in the Navy couldn't leave port either for lack of crew, non-commissioned officers, or for spare parts. We have embarked on a program designed to put us back to a position where we can meet the first prime responsibility of 
the federal government, which is national security. And I am pleased to tell you that over half the defense budget goes for personnel and maintenance, readiness. And the thing that has happened in the last two years is amazing. We have today the highest percentage of high school graduates in the armed services that we've ever had, even during the days of the draft. We have the highest percentage who are average or above in intelligence level than we've ever had in the military. We have the highest rate we've had in years and years in first term reenlistments. But most of all, we have a military now in which they are proud to wear the uniform. There is an esprit de corps that is just, it puts a lump in your throat when you come in contact with them and, and see it. And the other point is, we are restoring weaponry, which is the least part uh, of the uh, defense budget, but restoring weaponry that finally is going to enable us to meet our responsibilities wherever they may occur. For example, in planes, the young men who are flying the B-52s today are all younger than the planes they fly. And those planes are not up to what our opposition has. We now are producing tanks that are superior to those even though they're badly outnumbered by the Soviet Union. In short, we're on our way, but I think you should know this also. The preceding president, having hit bottom, in his last year projected a five-year, during 1980, projected a five-year increase and in improvement in the military, calling for increased spending. We are a little above that. But in February of 1981, when we proposed our five-year defense plan, through management uh, changes, through changes in procurement, through increased efficiencies, and with the decline in inflation, which I think that we had a hand in bringing about, we were able ourselves, before we submitted our budgets, to reduce them by $41 billion. I once told Cap that I thought he was being politically foolish. He should leave the $41 billion in there and let the Congress find it, and then they'd be happy. But uh, he cut it. Then they cut some more on the way. And now we have proposed $55 billion more in cuts over the next five years. And this is a total of practically the increase that we had first thought would be necessary over and above the proposal of the preceding president. Uh, we're down to about what was his proposal, but I do have to say something. Um, he couldn't have bought the weapons that they included as what were going to be in their buildup for the money that he had said would be the increase. There was a little underpricing of some of the things that uh, he had proposed buying. But this, mainly this fairness thing is the one that uh, I know it's been a drumbeat of propaganda and demagoguery about that. Uh, we don't think it is true at all. We are feeding 90, or giving to the people 95 million meals a day and are underwriting and subsidizing housing for 10 million families uh, in our present programs. And I could go on with other figures. I know there's been talk about Medicare and that we're increasing the uh, participation by the individuals at the beginning of Medicare illnesses. We are. But what no one has added in return for that, we are for the first time in history providing complete, unlimited, catastrophic care for those people. This has never before been done. We're talking about those illnesses that go on throughout the rest of their life and sometimes at costs of $100,000 a year. But in order to do that and to avoid overutilization, we're asking for some participation because we found out in California when we reformed welfare that the Medicaid patients 
were averaging five and a half times as long in the hospital for the same operations and illnesses as were those patients who were paying their own cost. Well, I went on too long. More questions. Uh, next question, please, uh, Governor Earl, and then we'll go to Governor Brown, if we may. Mr. President, um, I take issue with the defense spending and the of cuts, but let me focus on the fairness question that you raised. Recently, in my home state, 20,000 people lined up all day in the cold to apply for 200 jobs. Those 20,000 people are people who paid their dues. They're not the shirkers. They're not the people who didn't show up on Monday. They can't find work. They've got to provide for their families adequate nutrition, adequate shelter, adequate medical care. And at the same time that they face that, the federal government declines its support for those programs. We at the state level are required to pick them up, and regrettably, pick them up with taxes that are unfair and are regressive. Most of us, I would guess, first go to the sales tax. And the income tax in my state is fairly unpopular. And we have seen a bad skewing in the fairness side. Now, people like myself, I, I practiced law before I ran for office. The lawyers are doing pretty well, but the machine tool workers aren't doing very well. The people in the basic industries <coughs> aren't doing very well. And at a very time when we need some support for them, it seems to me our programs are skewing in the other direction. So when some of us criticize the defense spending and criticize the domestic cuts, it is because of the fairness notion and not simply for the purposes of political rhetoric. We, like you, would like to get the, the uh, budget balanced. I think if it is and, and we get uh, deficits under control, we'll see some return and strength in our major industry. But we don't seem to feel that the path that you and the Congress, the Democrats in the Congress as well, have chosen to follow are going to get us out of the wilderness and are only going to exacerbate our problems. Well, there's no one can quarrel with the situation with regard to the unemployed. But the answer to that has to be the recovery of the economy. In the meantime, we have increased extensions and added extensions of unemployment insurance because of the, the long-term unemployed, I think to a greater extent than has ever been done before. We're pro proposing a plan uh, to the Congress and one that would involve you at the state levels also in which, again, this includes increases in unemployment uh, payments for people, but also exploring the idea of using unemployment payments to see if we can't help. First of all, in training and relocation, combine that with the payment, but also we're talking about a voucher system in which a person could take, instead of his unemployment, could take a voucher for the amount of that unemployment to an employer. And the employer would get that pay from the government in return for taking this person on in a job and with the proper protections against taking him on and then dropping him when the voucher ran out and so forth. Um, all of these things being considered by us. The other day when the unemployment rolls dropped uh, simply by reason of the economy by four-tenths of a percentage point, that would take a $5 billion jobs bill to equal that same drop in unemployment. Now, one part of our program is accelerating needed work, not make work. Things that are in the budget for 84 by the, all the agencies and departments that they have to do, uh, whether it's construction, or repair, maintenance, whatever, uh, what we're suggesting to Congress is that they let us accelerate and move those up into 83 now and do that, which is going to have not only a direct effect on employment, but an indirect by way of supplies and equipment and so forth that would have to be uh, purchased, and then take that money out of the 84 budget, just move it up and spend it now. We'll do everything we can, except that I again must say, recognize that the greatest employer who's employing 100 million people now, a higher percentage employed in this recession of the total or potential workforce than we've known in times past when we had full employment. There is a structural facet to unemployment that doesn't have to do with the recession, and that is the increased numbers of people who are entering the workforce and the lack of skills 
for some of the jobs that are going begging in this time of unemployment. I say to any one of you on any given Sunday, just turn to the Help Wanted ads and see how many pages in any metropolitan paper there are of Help Wanted ads and then look at why the employer is advertising because of the skills that are required and those skills not available. And that's why we have in place now a job training act that will be worked at the community level in connection with local and uh, public leaders and industrial and business leaders to train people for the jobs that are going begging in that particular community, in that area. We've had too many job training programs in the past that really weren't training them with any regard as to whether there were open jobs in that skill that they were being taught or not. I think one of the most shocking in California several years ago after the Watts riots was a job training bill that paid people to come and learn to be dishwashers. And the people that were taking it were doing it for the money they were paid while they were taking the course because they laughingly would tell anyone that was around that those were the jobs they could get any day they wanted without taking any training. Um, we, we think that the first priority must be on will it or will it not help stimulate the economy because that is faster at getting recovery, providing employment, than anything government can do otherwise. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in all of our meetings up here, it seems like uh, all we discuss is how we're going to save it or how we're uh, going to spend it. But the most important thing is that's how we're going to make it. I'm chairman of the Small Business Task Force uh, for the governors. It looks to me like the key to this administration, our economy, is how do we have sales. And I met with uh, Secretary Reagan, and 80% uh, of all new jobs in the last decade has come from small business. Uh, being a former businessman, it's my opinion that big business is no more effective than big government. And I think we've demonstrated in this country that big business, for the most part, with some exceptions, can no longer compete. Uh, the best information I have is 70 percent of all new jobs come from companies less than five years old. And your, your tax incentive program, based on the same information, gives big business about a two to one uh, favorable position. Uh, the information from the Small Business Association, the National Small Business Association, shows that the top 100 growth companies that qualify for small business and in the form of their less than 200 people and X million dollars worth of business pays twice the tax in the top 100 companies in Fortune 500 because of appreciation tax credits and the sale of tax credits. I don't find any fault with the incentives you gave to big business to retool and to prepare for the future. I think we've missed a great opportunity to stimulate uh, the capital investment necessary to really create the jobs and get our economy moving. I know myself, I sold out when I was 37 years old and never went back to business because there wasn't the incentive there. I think the, the, the target areas I'd like for the administration to consider and, and for Don to, to give more thought to was the elimination of the double dividend taxation. I never could figure out why you pay taxes twice. And I think you alluded to that uh, in, in your prior, prior speech. Secondly, uh, the limitation of $3,000 maximum loss. Well, you're not going to get any venture capital in the marketplace. If you make a million dollars, you pay 46% tax. And if you lose, you want to run off the equity. They think you'll define the borrowing historically since the depression. They haven't been given the same kind of treatment nationally as big business. But I think if you're going to create the jobs and get our economy moving and lower debts, it's going to be how do we upsave? But we cannot save our way to prosperity. We're going to find, have to find a way to really uh, unleash the dynamics of the American economy. I'm satisfied we're there. And I'm satisfied with the fact that most in the small business sector, which today makes up about 45% of all jobs. Well, I couldn't agree with you more about who provides the jobs in the country. We thought we had done something with them in that 85 percent of small business uh, does not pay corporate tax. They pay uh, personal income tax. So the 25 percent cut we thought there uh, was something pretty sizable that we'd done. We have also, as you know, uh, are making an over phasing in another factor that was killing the family owned business, and that was the estate tax, the death in the family, and uh, the remainder of the family would have to sell the business of the farm in order to pay the estate taxes. And we're making changes in that, raising the minimum so that it would cover most of those small businesses, also making it that the spouse 
does not have to pay uh, an estate tax, the surviving spouse, things of that kind that we thought were beneficial. But uh, Don or Dave, uh, if I miss any points here, do you want to chime in? Uh, no, I think the governor's got a good point, Mr. President. Uh, these are uh, good things to do. Uh, they have been under consideration. They were not added uh, in the 1981 tax bill because we thought we already had enough in there for small business. Uh, we are more than willing to consider these uh, to see whether or not we can fit them into some huge kind of Yeah, that's, you know. The, the president will take a few more minutes. May I just suggest that as the governor asks his question or makes his statement, could we keep it about as short as we possibly can? And I have a list here, and Jim Hunt is next, and then we'll go from there if we may. Right. Mr. President, I'd like to suggest to you that there's another dimension to strong economic growth, in addition to what we do with taxes and regulations and all of that, all of which is critically important. And you've had great success with your program. I think you're seeing some, some real results from it. And that has to do with the, the kind of people we're developing whether or not they're the kind of people that are going to make us a productive society. Uh, your own Department of Commerce is going to come out with a report, I think, this week, saying that in the field of high technology, the United States has moved from a position of, quote, dominance to one of, quote, being strongly challenged in the world today. Uh, all of us know about the competition we're getting from Japan, but we ought to keep talking about that and keep focusing on that. They're taking 60% of the market in some of the new uh, microelectronic chip uh, development fields, for example. Uh, uh, you talked a moment ago about not being up to uh, our defense, not being up to the, the strength of our opposition. We would suggest that that's the same situation with regard to education in many respects. The New York Stock Exchange has just done a study which said that uh, it's not the quality of theory, it's not the practice of theory Z, it's not the business government partnership in which Japan has pushed ahead of us. It's what they have done with their educational system. 95% of their students today in Japan graduate from high school. That figure is 74% in the United States of America. We feel as governors that we really must respond in a very strong way, that we've got to have a dramatic upgrading of the quality and effectiveness of our educational system. Let me, let me put it this way, Mr. President. We feel, and, and business leaders increasingly all over this country, and they're involved in this with us today as governors, feel that tolerating the deterioration of our schools or the failure to upgrade them in this country is the equivalent of unilateral disarmament in national defense in terms of the economy failure to act with our schools and education is that equivalent with regard to national defense. We know how you feel about national defense. We think that that is an apt analogy. There are three things that are involved, of course, in technological innovation. One is uh, the quality of our elementary and secondary schools, uh, the quality of our universities and the research that's going on there. And then, of course, what we do to encourage uh, innovation and innovation in terms of assistance, uh, uh, capital, and so on. We think there are three things, Mr. President, that, uh, that really need to happen in this country if we're going to be successful. Number one, of course, this is an area where states and local governments have the primary responsibility. We don't shirk from that. Uh, we, we believe that's the case. Uh, but it also means that we have to put so many of our resources there. We have to go out and get more resources. And there are governors sitting around this table that are asking this year for substantial tax increases to provide those kinds of schools, to provide those kinds of people. We would urge that states not be cut more in ways that make it tougher to do that job of education. Second, Mr. President, I want to commend you and thank you for your initiatives. We were heartened when you said the kinds of things you did in your State of the Union address. You went to Boston. You went to uh, St. Louis. Uh, you've got some increases in your R&D budget. We would hope there would be more of those, but we commend those. Uh, finally, Mr. President, uh, the Congress is going to be acting in this field. There's the, the Perkins bill that's being uh, going through the House right now, which will provide more money in the math and science fields, crucial areas where we're so short on good teachers and so on. Uh, and then in the Senate, there are proposals for a high technology borrow act, which 
you've got agriculture going, you know, in 1862 and so on, uh, and other kinds of proposals. Many of us were hoping, and the Carnegie Foundation is working to try to pull a lot of these things together, that in the Senate we could have the development of a comprehensive approach that would help us become the strongest nation in the world in terms of developing our people to be productive and make education the tool for that kind of growth and that kind of stronger kind in the future. We appreciate what you're doing. We would simply say this is going to be the next place where the action will be in our view, and we hope you'll give us continued leadership. Not only that, but let me, and, and please don't take this as an attack on, on all of you, but over the years, can any of us deny that something has happened in the field of education? And it doesn't have to do with the, the kids lacking in ability or not. But I heard a, an educator in the air the other day talking about the great shortage in our country now of engineers and of people qualified for work in these high-tech fields. And this one was saying that in the particular state there, their teacher colleges had only graduated in one year six teachers qualified to teach mathematics in a whole state. Now, where, how many of us, what do we know about what courses are required and what are uh, electives and the part of the students? When I was going to school, uh, I know that to get out of high school, you had, to, you had to have studied all the way through geometry. And the principle was in school that no young person at that age knows what they may turn out wanting to do and be as they get older. So they're exposed to everything. But I have a feeling that in most schools today, um, most of the courses are elected. The student is supposed to be wise enough to choose what they want to study and not study these things that uh, look hard and look boring, mathematics and compared to some of the other courses that are available. And is this not a place for us to turn and say, let's get back to as adults making the decision of what we think young people should be exposed to until they are at an age and a level where they begin to have some idea as to what they want to do and then choose the courses. But a foreign language was a requirement in every school that I knew. As I say, mathematics all the way through was a requirement. And how do we justify the colleges and universities that we have in the country today with their bonehead courses, that they have special courses that incoming freshmen have to take in order to learn to read, and yet they come there with a high school diploma in their hands. I had a, a mother, a black mother one day, corral me, and she said, don't talk to me about busing or things of that kind. She said, talk to me about keeping my son in the class he's in until he learns what he was supposed to learn in that class, stop passing him up to another class simply because he's come to the end of the year. And if we don't believe that's happening in a great many of our public schools today, you can bet it is. And the result is that, as she said, he gets a diploma, he's out of high school, and he can't read his diploma. Now, uh, we are discussing and have been discussing in cabinet about what we might be able to do at, at our level to help with this shortage with regard to mathematics. If a kid does not have mathematics by the time he's 16 years of age, extensive mathematics, that kid can never, never be an engineer. He can never get into the courses if he decides then, as a 17 or 18 year old, that engineering might be what he wants. And we know that engineering is one of the great shortages in, our, in the United States today. Well, I didn't. Mr. President, uh, two things if I could add on. The education proposal you mentioned in your State of the Union is going to be scrubbed up this week while you're in California with hopes to be presented to you on Monday so it can go next week up to Capitol Hill. Um, and with that, that was the chopper that's now landed to no. take you to California. So we're going to have to terminate this. Um, if you have any parting comments or no, I think I'll just leave by telling you my favorite story. All my people have heard it, and they're going to groan. Uh, we talk so much, and we deal so much today in economic projections. Three gentlemen arrived at the gates of heaven, and St. Peter had to tell them there was only room inside for one. And he said, we've decided that the one who's practicing the oldest 
trade or profession will be admitted. And so a doctor stepped forward and said, well, the Lord made Adam, and then with a rib from Adam made Eve, that makes him a surgeon, I guess I'm the one. Before he could move in, the second one said, just a minute, before the Lord made Adam and Eve, all was chaos, and the Lord took the chaos and in six days fashioned the earth. I guess he was an engineer, so that means me. And as he started to go in, the third one said, I'm an economist. Where do you think he got all that chaos? <laughs> Thank you.